Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Ch- Chad Etmuller and Monty Walker. They are with JCR Settlements. We're going to talk about structured uh, payments and structured, uh, I guess it's an annuity-based product. Structured installment sales. So structured installment sales. So. Basically, how to save money when you sell your business through ways it can defer taxes and to make sure you have an income long term. So I appreciate having you here. Well, thank you, Arnold, for having us. We appreciate that the opportunity. So let's just start off with a little bit of origin story. Who are the, you know, kind of introduce each of you to introduce yourselves, and then we're going to introduce who JCR Settlements is, yeah, and then we'll get Monty into the media. First. Yeah, Marky, go ahead. I'm uh, Monty Walker. I'm based, I am based in Texas. I'm a CPA from a formal background. I practice nationally, primarily in supporting the M&A industry, dealing with business ownership transitioning. So my sandbox that I'm in every day is helping entrepreneurs try to determine how to keep more of the funds when they go to sell their company as opposed to giving it to the government. Awesome. And Chad, tell us about yourself a little bit. Yeah. So my name is Chad Etmuller with JCR Settlements. We are... Uh... A settlement planning firm. We're based in Scottsdale, Arizona, although I office half of the year out of Georgia and half of the year out of Michigan. But uh, we offer a structured installment sale product that we're going to talk about today, which was built on the 50 year chassis and 50 year history of the structured settlement industry. So we we may seemingly start in an area where your viewers are going to go, what are, what is this? Uh, that we're talking about, but it, it'll make a lot of sense once we work through it a little bit. I think so. And what we're talking about is them making more money when they exit in, in a very unique way. So th- I was telling uh, Monty before you ca- were able to come on, this has been shown to me once before, like the week I got into this space. So got into this space, came out of the real estate world, got into this space, was going to all the business network, BNIs, the business networking stuff one. Looking for CPAs and stuff who knew a lot of business owners. Hey, if anybody's ready to retire, I've got a group of people. We've raised some money. We want to buy a company. And one of the guys pulled me aside and he showed me this structured settlement kind of uh, installment through uh, annuity insurance product where the owner could put money in it, get paid over time, earn. I think he even said like a like they have a structure was like pretty much guaranteed a certain amount uh, uh, because the security probably wasn't a guarantee, but it was like 8% was like the minimum they'd ever seen. I've seen your sheet uh, has its own, but, um, it went over my head. I was telling Monty, it just kind of went, and I was like, okay, that's a little more convoluted or the way he explained it. It's like, I can't explain that to a business owner if I just meet him. So my goal was, is if we had one that met the criteria he outlined, I would just bring him in and show it. So hopefully today, what we're going to do is we're going to, you guys are going to teach me. That's what I do on the show. I do this show because I want to learn different things about the industry. And then we share it with everybody in the industry because they, I'm sure they want to learn the same things I want to learn. So let's start off with what is it? What yeah. is this product that you guys have? Yeah. So in order to tell you what it is, I'm going to go back a little bit further. And I mentioned that I'm a settlement planner. Mm-hmm. My firm, traditionally, we are working with individuals who've been catastrophically injured, maybe family members who have lost a loved one to a, a tragic event. And we will help those individuals settle their litigation. And then we invest their settlement into fixed or indexed annuity products where they can design a future payment schedule that meets their unique need, kind of take the financial stress away from them about how they're going to meet the mortgage payment, how they're going to pay for their health insurance and their future medical needs, how they're going to go on that family vacation with diminished earnings and such. and so you can appreciate, we were talking earlier about some, some friends of yours who had endured traumatic injuries, right? It's life-changing. And 
And so we're there to help them secure peace of mind through the annuity investment uh, structures. So the same life insurance companies, Ronald, with whom we place those structured settlements, have jumped into the real estate and business sales space under Section 453 of the Internal Revenue Code, which deals with installment sales. They are now offering those same annuity products that I was just talking about that we use for injured parties in their litigation. Now, an individual who is selling their property or their business can defer their immediate capital gains tax obligation by placing a portion of their sales transaction into one of these annuity products. And really, the name of the game is constructive receipt. Uh, the IRS can't tax a seller on what he or she doesn't take receipt of at the time of sale. So the key to this whole structured installment sale transaction is allowing the individual to de define the amount that they want to place into the annuity. And then we assure that money goes directly from the escrow account to the life insurance company with whom that annuity is placed. IRS can't tax them on that portion, but the IRS will eventually tax them. And, and they're going to tax them in the future year or years when those annuity payments are received. Uh, the best part about it, though, Ronald, is they can design the payment schedule in any manner that they would like. They can defer their first payment for up to 40 years if they wanted to. By doing that, they're, of course, deferring their tax obligation for that period of time. And then they'll pay a twofold tax obligation in the future years that they receive the payments. There will be a prorated capital gains tax obligation and then a prorated ordinary income tax obligation on the, the amounts received in that given future calendar year. That's what I was going to ask. Is it ordinary income or capital gains at the end? So it's a prorated of both. So I guess the prorated capital gains would be based on a basis of what they, at the point of time, what was sold at. And then I guess it would be capital gains on anything that that in, that increased upon the time that it was held in the annuity and making money, or how does that work? Now, when the, when the asset or asset, of course, when, as you're quite aware, Ronald, when you're selling a company, mm -hmm. there's multiple assets. So uh, the tax people have to deal with the gains that are coming from each of the respective assets. So when we're dealing with this topic today and specifically code section 453, which is your installments or installment method provisions. We are dealing with the actual capital gain that comes out of a transaction that would not be subject to any form of ordinary income tax treatment that would happen with a piece of equipment as an example. So equipment, uh, subject to depreciation, depreciation recapture is the term that's mm -hmm. associated with any gain that comes back in from prior depreciation that would not be included as an example. But any gain that would happen that truly is subject to treatment as a capital gain, that's what applies here. And so that amount of money in this particular strategy can be deferred. It would not be recognized at this point in time. It would be deferred. And because it's deferred, then that money is used to compound and grow. And in the future, when funds are paid out underneath this solution, at that point, whatever portion is being paid out in an annual year, that gets taxed. And it gets taxed at capital gain rate for the gain deferral and any income that's associated with the investment process that we're talking about here. Of course, that's an ordinary uh, item because that's an income growth item. But the gain itself is going to be subject to capital gain and taxed at the rates in place at the time of the payment when they occur in the future. Okay. So <laughs> how does this work inside of a business sale? I get it on a structured settlement, right? I get it on like, you know, I get a lawsuit and they give us a judgment. I work, reach out to a company like you and the judgment goes straight into the annuity product, right? The insurance product. And then we structure what payment should look like. Instead of a business sale transaction, there are two different ways they can be sold, right? You can buy the corporation, you can do the, uh, buy the S corp, or you can do an asset transfer, the asset sale. The most people want to do the asset sale because it helps mitigate the potential liabilities of the company. You're not buying the actual corporation. You're buying the assets of it, including the brand. And you'll probably end up dissolving that LLC or C Corp and setting up your own so you're not carrying the liabilities for it. So what does it look like along that? I'm thinking about the value. So I know when we do the evaluation, and at the end of the day, there's a check. I guess uh, the the attorneys and the CPAs figure out 
what portion of that check goes where, right? So the, I guess the question is, how does it go from, in this case, what you were just were described was the asset sell. How does it go from there to the uh, the insurance product? Okay, Ronald, uh, as we you brought, you've opened up a wide spectrum <laughs> of, of response options, okay? So when, when dealing with a transaction, you've referenced LLC, mm -hmm. you've thrown out S Corp, you've thrown out C Corp. And, right. and so there are some fundamentals that are consistent between each, but each entity then has its own application in terms of what happens in a business transaction, right? So let's just talk about the fundamental component and then we can back up and address anything specific to an entity that way. We don't get, we don't have any confusion in just the general response. So when, when dealing with a business transaction, if it happens, and I'm going to reference both asset, asset and equity, okay, just broadly. So in a business transaction, if there is a asset transaction that is occurring, you're, you will have a some certain that's been agreed upon between the parties, whatever that price is. And we're not going to get complex here to say that they have future earnouts and we're going to just they come up with an agreed upon price, period. Now with that price, there, there will be a cash component and it's not uncommon that there would be some seller financing. Okay. But let's just go from the premise that we have a full cash deal. They have a plenty of money and or bank financing, but they've got a cash offer on the table. At that juncture with that cash coming in, that seller the owner of the business entity, the seller can make a decision on how much of that incoming cash they ultimately would take possession. They can choose how much then would not be taken in possession and it would be handled through the structuring. When that choice is made, once again, from the premise, we have an all cash deal. And if the choice is made by the seller, that the seller says, I would like 75% of the total transaction proceeds to be structured through this process. What will happen at that point is there will be some paperwork. I mean, Chad will talk about, there will be some documents some paperwork that will be addended to their existing contract, not a brand new contract, but some paperwork addended to their existing contract. And then that portion of the funds that are associated with the choice that the seller has made to structure, those po that portion of funds will never make its way directly to the seller. So we have no, con we have no receipt. Uh, we, what we actually have is a process called, uh, referred to as a substitute obligor that steps in and Ted can expand on that. But the, so there's an obligor that's in place to make payments under this arrangement because this, when that 75% in my example, become structured, what's really happening is the seller says, I'm going to enter into an installment arrangement with that buyer for that 75 and, and, and buyer, you won't give me the money that you have available. You will make, you will transfer that appropriately through the mechanism to the settlement group. And then that settlement group will take responsibility for making payment under that arrangement in the future. That's the settlement. Now that is in an asset transaction or in a equity transaction, that process is the same, okay? Either in an equity deal or in an asset deal, that's the same. So what we can do, if it's good with you, Chad can expand on, okay, now that the 75% is handed over and is happening, how does that flow? Then Ronald, what we can do is expand as deep as you want, coming back to entity types, equity or, or asset. And I think for you, that's probably gonna be helpful to dig a little deep yeah. to understand mechanics. But this top level, now we go that 75%, whether it's an equity or a asset transaction, we've now got an installment arrangement that's in place for the 75. The monies will not reach the seller. They in turn are moving over to the structuring side. And so Chad would step in now and give the explanation. Yeah, and, and so Ron, what we would do is, is ideally we want to work with the seller a couple of weeks uh, to a month in advance of their actual closing. Last thing anybody wants to do is show up at the closing table and spring uh, a section 453 installment sale on everybody. That's the surest way to kill a deal. Um, so we want to work with the seller well in advance of, of their data closing 
and we'll help them. At Commodities Point, they've already identified that they want to take 75% of their transaction and defer their capital gains obligation on that by placing it into a structured installment sale. So at this point, we have a couple of options. We've got fixed annuity products uh, through MetLife or Independent Life, or we have an index-linked annuity option through Independent Life in partnership with Franklin Templeton Advisors and Bank of America. Um, the, the index is actually the Franklin Bank of America Global Index. So it's taking not only the best of what the American market has to offer, but also the Asian and European market. And so we'll talk through the merits of the fixed annuity and we'll show illustrations associated with that. The yields on a fixed annuity product are around four to four and a half percent. Not bad, not great. Better than they were back in 2006, 2007 when we were doing this with, with 2% yields. The index returns uh, are as high as 12%. Um, and so that's pretty significant. That's a game changer. But we'll help them design a payment schedule that meets their unique needs and the needs of their families. And, and to give you a quick example, I had a gentleman in, in Florida who sold his business and adjacent property for $25 million. At the closing table, he took $10 million and put it into an indexed annuity product. At closing, he, he funneled the 10 million through escrow to independent life. By doing that, Ronald, he saved 1.2 million roughly in immediate tax obligation. So that was his first victory for which he was very excited. But he's 51 years old and he said, I don't want to take any payment until my age 65. So we did that. We defer, we are deferring in the process of deferring his first payment for 14 years. He's not going to pay a penny's tax on that $10 million for 14 years. And it's just going to sit there and accumulate interest, right? Einstein said, the second most powerful force in the universe is compounding interest. And, and you're going to see why here in this example. And so this gentleman then said, I'm going to take monthly payments from age 65 to 85. And we project that through the performance of that index, we're going to turn his 10 million into between 64 and $130 million. So his $25 million transaction just became potentially $150 million transaction. The best part of all of this is there are no fees associated with this to any party. I get paid as the settlement planner and the broker, I get paid a one-time commission by the life insurance company. I don't get a trailing commission. And so I get paid once at closing uh, based on the amount that's invested. There are no fees to, to any party. And then his question, the obvious question is, well, what happens if I pass away? Well, the named beneficiaries will receive all remaining guaranteed payments and they'll pay the same tax obligation that the seller would have paid. There's no additional estate tax, no additional inheritance tax associated with it. And so this gentleman had a three-year-old and a five-year-old and he was excited that he saved 1.2 million in immediate taxes but more excited that should he pass away, he had passed on generational wealth to his daughters. So now it's a, they get the structured payments the same way, or is there an option for them to get some type of lump sum? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the payment schedule, because it's incorporated as an addendum to the sales contract, remains intact. Okay. With some annuity contracts, you can commute those payments. I can tell you one of the life companies considering commutation and trying to discern how they can do that within the confines of Section 453. But right now, you have to be very thoughtful in the, the payment design and schedule because it can't be changed. So if somebody finds 10 years down the road that they have need for liquidity, they can't accelerate the annuity payments. But what they can do is take that annuity contract to their local banking institution and secure a personal loan using that annuity contract as collateral. That's what I was going to ask, because a lot of these annuity products actually can act as a personal bank, too, where you can borrow money against your own annuity with inside of the annuity structure. Is that something that this, these things do, or is that a, that's a totally different product? Yeah, no, you can't do that. And I'll let Monty uh, discuss the, the tax reasons for that. But in short, uh, once the annuity payment schedule is defined and the premium has been paid to the life company to fund those future periodic payments, and because it's part of the actual sales transaction that both parties signed off on, it can't be changed. Okay. So I, I take it to the, one, the products I'm thinking about that act as like pr private banks. It's because it's post-tax dollars instead of pre-tax dollars. Exactly. That's why they can do that. Okay. I'm going to 
I'll just kind of switch gears on you just slightly a little bit here. We talked about lump sum where the uh, buyer comes in. Uh, and uh, before we do that, you, you said that might disrupt the buyer. In my mind, when you guys put this in place, the only thing that changes in the buyer's world is the wiring instructions, right? The buyer's attorney, you know, he wires the money to the buyer's attorney or the, the attorney's dealing the deal kind of as escrow. And the wiring instructions goes from the seller's wire to your wire as opposed to that. So from a buyer's perspective, I don't see how that disrupts anything I would be doing as an act, as acquiring a company. Yeah, it does. It. Now, the buyer is going to sign a, qual a non-qualified assignment agreement, right? And that's an important document for the buyer because it transfers the future payment annuity payment obligations to the life insurance company with whom that annuity has been placed. So not only is there an addendum to the sales contract or the purchase agreement that details that a portion of these funds in accordance with Section 453 are going to be placed into a structured installment sale, but there's also a non-qualified assignment that says all of the obligation to make those future payments is now resting with either MetLife or Independent Life as the two life markets that are offering this product. I don't know which one of you can answer this, but the, the second question I have is what happens when it's not just a cash deal, right? Where I come in, you want $10 million for your business. You agree to take, you know, half of it through an SBA loan and the other half you're going to do through some type of structured payment from the buyer. Can that be put in that annuity too, where the buyer's paying a structured settlement into the, or is it a one-time stuff money into it? Or can you build on it? Like the uh, meaning that can my payment is like, let's put me in the shoes of the buyer. I'm buying the company. I take a $5 million, a $10 million company. I take 5 million from SBA. I, I agree with the seller that I'm going to pay them a certain amount for the next say 15 years. Can those payments also contribute to your product where I'm paying you as opposed to him? They cannot. Okay. Uh, so we can only work with the cash that is available at the closing table. And again, that's because there's an addendum to the sales contract that defines that future periodic payment schedule. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for us to know that if the buyer is making an installment payment two years from now, there's no way for us to define what those parameters are going to be or what those payment amounts are going to be two years into the future. So we can only work with the amount of cash that is available on the day of closing. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So what does it look like as far as setting something like this up? Why, why would a seller want to do it or versus not want to do it? What, what would be the, the like decision-making process for, if I'm the seller, why would I want to talk to you guys? Yeah. Well, that, the illustration we just discussed with my client in Florida, right? There's two advantages there. He not only saved 1.2 million in immediate tax obligation and spread that out over a 34 year time period. That's the first reason any seller would want to consider this. The second reason is that it allows them to truly maximize their net sale proceeds. His $25 million transaction just became a hundred to 150 million dollar transaction when the, the annuity payments are, are finalized. You know, these business owners have, have put their blood, sweat, and tears into to building their company, and they now have an opportunity to sell it. It's going to be, for many of them, their one opportunity to cash in. And this offers an opportunity to not only defer taxes in accordance with Section 453, but to really amplify their sales proceeds and design a payment schedule that meets the unique needs of, of either them individually or their family. And if done correctly, it can really generate and, and provide for generational wealth. And from a tax perspective, I'm sure Monty has some other advantages that he would advise his clients on. So from a tax advantage, you're deferring taxes. And I guess the, the theory out there, or the, uh, yeah. hinds, the hindsight is, they, is taxes hey, rarely go down, they always go up. It seems so like are, do, do the potential seller have a potential of paying higher taxes on, per dollar? on that deferred or what's the risk exposure from deferring the taxes on an, an annuity like this? Yeah. So I, I think Ronald, that the capital gains rate is at the, the year where the future payments are received. It's not the cap right. gains rate in, in the year of sale. So in our previous example, my, my Florida client, he's selling in 2023, but he's not going to receive payments for 14 years. And so to your point, we don't have a we don't have that crystal ball. We don't know what the tax uh, hit is going to be. So there is some risk that the cap gains is going to be 
slightly higher than it is in the year of sale. But I think that's offset by the fact that you've deferred and spread the tax obligation out over a longer period of time. And it's further offset by the fact that you're amplifying the net sales proceeds through the growth of the investment. And so you have an opportunity to really, unfortunately, we, we don't have that crystal ball. We don't know what that cap gains tax is going to be in the future year. That is a risk, but I think it's a calculated risk and it's one worth taking when you counterbalance that against the earnings that you're going to receive through the investment annuity. There's the other side of that estate planning side of this, right? Where you, a lot of business owners, they're selling because they know they have a health risk. They know they have something going on in their life. They want to spend more time with their family. The fact that this goes to the kids in a structured way is a big risk. I've talked to hundreds of business owners at this point. And one of the things is, is like a lot of times I do a lot of off market reach out. And a lot of times like, I don't, I don't, I don't need the money. I don't know why I would want to sell. And I damn sure don't want to give my kids the money right now. They're not very good with money. So the first thing I always say is, well, we can set up, I've got attorneys that'll set up a trust for you and we'll put the money in that and then get it structured. This would be another way to say, Hey, look, you're worried about the kids just blowing the money. We can put it in something where it get, they get it over 30 years. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's no reason why the annuity payments, Ronald, couldn't be made to a trust, right? right. And, and my people will have some, some opinion on that. I mean, we have to set it up correctly and, but it can be further insulated and, and protected from being squandered, but it's, it's a tax smart strategy at the end of the day that allows folks to uniquely design and prepare for their future. And to your point, unfortunately, as we age, we don't get in better health. We find ourselves in failing health. And so if designed properly, you can really make certain that you've got some hefty monthly income or annual income coming in the door in your eighties or nineties. So that God forbid you find yourself in a situation where you need assisted living care you have the financial wherewithal to pay, to pay for that and live your final years with dignity rather than being shoved in a, a nursing home somewhere. I think that's my way to go. I think I, when it's time for me to be in a rest home, I want to be stuck on a cruise ship somewhere and uh, have enough money that my kids don't have to say anything. But I'm kind of one of those guys too. I've got a, my, my kid, children are 12, about to be 13 and seven, about to be eight. And the, the girl so far, my youngest, she's probably more on the lines of at eight years old, it's hard to tell, but at this stage in life, she's extremely intelligent and very good with money. My 12 year old, it, I don't care if it's $20 million, it would be gone in a week. He'd buy a video game empire. I could see where one structured, you know, structured for myself, for the family. Now I'm going to get into something that keeps coming in my mind. Is it just off the beneficiaries or is it like most insurance policies where it's per, where it's, where it's per bloodline? So can I, if, if something happens to me and I have it, my beneficiary as my wife, the, the secondary beneficiary, or what you call it, successor beneficiaries, my kids. If something happens, we're all in a car wreck. Is it still going to be per surface? That money goes somewhere. It goes to, to whomever. You can name a lineage of beneficiaries as deep as you would like. And then, God forbid, you pass away and your wife yeah. assumes the payments as your primary beneficiary. Mm -hmm. She will then name her own beneficiaries. And again, she can create a lineage as deep as she would like, Ronald. And it can be beyond bloodlines, right? To, to okay. Work. It can be, uh, you can name a local nonprofit organization or religious group that she wants to be the beneficiaries. And you can assign different percentages to various different uh, beneficiaries as well. There, there's no, no limitations on that. Now, God forbid you pass away with no contingency plan and no named beneficiaries. Well, that's going to go into probate and the probate judge is going to determine where the balance of the remaining payments goes. Okay. You answered the question and the fact that the, the future beneficiary gets to define their beneficiaries for the remainder of that, because that's a structured payment, X number of dollars for X number of years, right? Correct. And again, I, if I didn't mention this before, I want to mention it again now. There's no additional estate or inheritance tax associated with that. The right. beneficiaries will pay the same prorated cap gains and prorated ordinary income uh, tax obligation that the seller would have paid. Uh, because it's all defined in the corpus event, which is the sales contract and, and addendum and, and sales transaction of, of either the business or property. And, that, and that's called the income in respect of a decedent. Now, I've got one. The SBA is currently, like, there's rumor flying yesterday and the day before, they just changed how they do uh, transactions with real estate attached. 
uh, whether the real estate's got 51% of the value or less, or it changes the rules now. And I, I'm still looking for somebody to clarify it because there's, we're, we're throwing a, a Twitter chat around. This is November 15th when we recorded that yeah, yesterday there was some statement things of something went in effect yesterday. It changed that. That said, if it's two different transactions, I'm buying a, a business with real estate. Can I shove both those transactions into the like my real estate proceeds and my business proceeds into the same structured annuity? Is, is that or is that two different events? Hey, in dealing with the in dealing with the question associated with the, the real estate, mm -hmm. okay. And since you brought up SBA, mm -hmm. SBA has a process for business owners where they have a structure called an EPCOC. Okay? Not mm -hmm. trying to get overly complicated, but the SBA it's a direct correlation to SBA. Mm -hmm. EPC is an eligible passive company. Mm -hmm. OC is the operating company. Very common in business structuring where the operating entity will be separate. Real estate will be in its own company. Mm -hmm. Then they'll lease the real estate back. I'm going from the premise that's associated with how your question is coming because that's the most common thing that you'll see. What you actually have in that scenario is you have two different sellers, two completely different sellers. Yeah, right. Technically, yeah. Yep. The OC that you may have a group and they're recognized together and under common control, all those things. But you have two different sellers. So this comes back to the premise of your point shortly ago before I froze out. And that was the buyer is not affected by this, it seems like. Well, yes and no. The buyer is not affected by the outcome that the buyer has in front of the buyer. The buyer's still gonna buy the business. The outcome is gonna be the same. They're gonna own, the buyer's gonna own the asset. But the buyer does have to agree to an installment provision addendum that's coming to bear here. So all of a sudden the buyer is agreeing that, hey, I've got cash, I am paying for this whole thing. But the buyer is executing a, a documents that essentially is changing a component of this into an installment provision. And that's how come we can structure this into the future. So if there is all cash, that's all cash. But if it's anything other than just all cash, there must be something else happening. And so the buyer is entering into an agreement with the seller to essentially have an installment provision now in place. And the buyer is bringing cash that as opposed to being handed to the seller will be handed over to the installment, I mean, to the settlement group to handle the installment payments under that new addendum that's been added. So if we come back to your premise now and say, Mr. Buyer, you're buying real estate and you're buying a, a business, the issue is who's the seller? If it's an asset transaction, the real estate holding entity is the seller and the entity holding the business is a seller. Now we have installment notes in place with each. And we're going to have an annuity solution that meets the installment note obligation each because we have separate sellers. And same thing would not necessarily be true if it were equity, because now we could possibly have a one seller person. So now we have multiple assets from one person. So we could have a common annuity solution there, but separate sellers each has to have their own. So in scenario one, we would use one product or two product from Chad. In scenario one with two, EPCOC, top environment with the SBA, operating mm -hmm. company separate, we would have two. So we'd so basically have be... two of these annuities, two different, like two sets of documents, two structured things. Payments would add up. It, it, the end result, the, the seller would uh, get a check or two that would equal to what he needs to live on. The difference is, is the way the product would be structured. And then the option two is it could be potentially it's just all in one because it's a one seller. That makes sense. So, uh, yeah, and, and Ronald, I should mention it's not uncommon for sellers to take whatever portion they've de determined is going to go into the installment sale and place part of that with MetLife and then have a fixed annuity design in place and place part of it with independent life and have an indexed annuity in place so that they have multiple investments and they've diversified uh, across different financial platforms as well. So, it's not an all or nothing scenario for the seller. Is that, is that, I was about to ask that question. Is it a one and done thing? Like, can I, is it certain things in the uh, tax code? You can do one of these, right? You can only do X or you can only put so much in per year or one of those type of things. So potentially. So there, is, there, there is an interest penalty on the sale of a business. If, if 
a seller is looking to place more than $5 million into a structured installment sale, there's an interest penalty in short. And Monty, please correct me where I, I, I miss speaking. I'm not the tax professional, Monty, so I want to make sure I, I don't uh, step on his toes. But there is an interest penalty. There's a formula for us to determine what that interest penalty is. Uh, and one of the strategies that many of our sellers are, are deploying to address that if they want to put in more than $5 million is we just determine what that interest penalty is. And we set up a lump sum to be paid every January 15th in that amount that they use to make their interest payment, uh, interest penalty payment, but they continue to enjoy a deferral of, of over $5 million. There is an exception. If you are selling farm land uh, or land uh, or acreage that could be used in the future for farming purposes, there is no cap. There's no $5 million cap. So you could put, you had a, a $200 million sale. You could put as much of that into the structure as you'd like. And Monty, please correct me where I may have misspoke. No, and that's accurate. Now you're, now Ronald, this comes back to your LLC, S Corp, C Corp. It, the dynamics begin to change because you have taxation for S Corps, as an example, that occur with the individual owners. So if you have, two different owners and you have a, a, a structure that happens with the sale of the assets, those get deployed out to the respective owners. And that's where the limitations exist is with those individual owners. But the main thing is if you have over 5 million in a single transaction, that gain deferral, the IRS or the internal revenue code uh, says that there will be an interest factor calculated on the excess gain above the five because you're not paying tax and it's the gain on the tax. It's a okay. the tax. I mean, it's the interest on the tax that you would pay is what you have to pay. And so that you obviously have things getting really fine out when you talk about the entity types, but it's anything above 5 million in gain. You have to pay some interest on the deferred tax. Yeah. So these guys are selling these pro sports franchises, Ronald, you know, for four, for $400 billion, a $5 million uh, cap is, is, I mean, that's, that's silly, but, but to, to Manji's point, we can discern what that that penalty is and, and set up an annuity payment to address that. Now, I know what I asked earlier about a one and done. So a lot of these guys sell their business because they've got a brighter idea. They've got something else, a side business that's starting to take off. So they'll sell an SBA qualified business, meaning they're doing 5 million valuation or lower because they've got a side, like here's one we evaluated. I can't say the name because the NDAs. Software company doing pretty good. Probably, you know, if they get the multiple they want, they'll sell it 4.5, 4.4 million dollars. His other business already has the one the one he spun out of underneath there a sub idea that they tried as a product took off and is already doing two million in EBITDA. It doesn't make sense to run both. Like he needs to focus on the other one. So my question is, he sells this, he puts some of this money, you know, maybe two and a half of that four or something in this product. Four years later, he gets bored with this next one. Can, is this a one and done or can he have multiple of these annuities? Can he, uh, can he have multiple of your products? You can do multiple. Okay. So it's not that, it's not that you've sold something now and you can never do another, another sell. Yeah. So it's a lot of it's going to be the structure, but yes, you, it's not an annual limit. Like if you were thinking about a, a limit, a great a one that people often recognize is a sale of a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of common to a lot of everybody. They know that the married couple, they can get a, 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 an exemption on a certain amount of that. But if you try to pull the thing, same thing off the next year, you can't do it. So that, that something like that doesn't right. apply here at all. I laugh because I have a few dozen houses. Like, yeah, I wish I could get it every year. Yeah, but, but you could use this strategy, right? Yeah. And defer your, your gains, but more importantly, maximize your sale and amplify your sales through the design of the annuity. So there's also nothing stopping anybody from doing, taking the lump sum they get in a structured payment. Like, you know, for a guy like me who likes to get the owner to carry some skin in the game, get, you know, the money they get up front can go into the annuity, then I'm still paying them a payment on the other side of it. It's just limit, you know, it would limit the uh, amount that they could put in there. Of course, they could only put up to my, whatever chunk of cash I give them as a down payment they could put into that annuity, right? Now, you know, let's think about the kind of the premise of the question that let's say that you had somebody that cut a deal the way you described it where I think you were describing 50, 50, yeah. you're going to have almost half of the transaction coming through in cash. And then the other half was already a note with the seller. 
Right. Now, what that leaves you with is one half of the total deal that was cash. And then, yes, the seller could then decide that they, how much of that cash portion that they want to structure. Now let's, let's take this premise to a $10 million deal. Mm -hmm. Not trying to overinflate, but just to get us into the, the limits. So if you have a $10 million deal and 5 million of that is already a note, 5 million is already a note. And then you have uh, five million, the other 5 million that would be cash. Well, if you, if the seller, and we got one seller, let's assume it's one seller. If that seller structures a part of that cash, they are already above the 5 million limit because they had 5 million that was already in an installment note. Oh, so the limit is the installment note, not the, whatever we're putting into this particular structure. It's the code rig. Yeah. It's the code rig provisions in that transaction. Mm. So yes. So you have to look at the transaction and apply the limits within the scope of the transaction. But I might add most of the time I've been in these business deals and you're probably familiar with your works in this space as well. You don't see this level with that much money and these limits already happening. Most of the time it's, we're dealing with the cash piece and worrying about limits on how much we're setting due to that, due to the cash. Right. So the reason I was asking is a lot of times you get to end up getting creative with the seller because they want to do something like this, but they want to do something else and, or they want, you know, but it sounds like they get to define this. Like they want some of the money down now and they want, because they have to live on that for the next couple of years, or they want to put that money towards our next project, but they're okay for taking the rest of it in installments. Yeah. So. It, it's really all about the opportunity to defer tax and the flexibility that this solution provides you, right? I'm going to pivot for a second. I know we're business focused on this podcast, but, but just as an example, a, a popular tax strategy in real estate transactions are 1031 exchange, where you're just rolling your profits into the next property uh, right. and deferring your tax obligation that way. Well, in today's market, we've got all time highs in the real estate market. That's great. Wonderful to sell at the top of the market. It's not necessarily great to buy at the top of the market. And inventory is difficult right now to find. And so what we have a lot of real estate professionals coming to us with are clients who are, are accustomed to that 1031 process, but they don't want to do that anymore. They can't find a property that, that they are willing to pay for. And so what we're doing is putting those proceeds into the structured installment sale and we're allowing for a single lump sum in three years or mm -hmm. five years from now. And they know what that lump sum amount is going to be. And it gives them three to five years worth of runway. Uh, one, they're deferring the taxes, but it, it gives them some runway to identify that next property that they want to buy. They know that they've got that lump sum forthcoming and they, they're going to have to pay their tax obligation when they receive that lump sum, but it allows them to identify the next property or in, in the case of a business owner, the next entrepreneurial endeavor that they, they want to jump into, it gives them some runway and you can define the payment and payments can come the following year or they can be deferred up to 40 years. So the flexibility that the seller has, Ronald, is second to none, it gives them opportunity to think about what their next chess move is going to be. They don't have to have that all figured out at the time of sale. So if somebody's listening right now and they're thinking about selling or they're in the middle of selling their business and they're worried about the tax hit, what are the criteria to do something like this? Like, well, what, when does it make sense? Is it a million dollar transaction, a $500,000 transaction? Give me kind of the parameters in which that makes sense to, to have a call with Chad here. Yeah, well, it's a great question and I appreciate it. And there's really no right answer. I, I will tell you, I've, I've, had, I've done deals as small as $20,000, right? And it was, it was a, a couple, a lovely couple in their 80s. They had a very modest electrical business. They sold it uh, for under a million dollars, but they had just had their first grandchild who was born and they wanted uh, to make sure that his college education was taken care of. So they took $20,000 of their sale, put it into a structured installment sale, and are making four annual payments to coincide with when he will be going to college. It turned into roughly over $225,000 for him. So they were thrilled with that opportunity, but it was a $20,000 transaction. So I appreciate the question. The answer would be, 
it's appropriate in any situation where the seller needs or wants to defer taxes and needs or wants to do some financial strategizing or, or forecasting that we can accomplish for them. There's virtually no scenario that a seller could bring to me that I can't put in place for them in terms of future payment design. I can pay monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually. I can drop lump sums in along the way on identified future date, or we can do a combination of all of those payments. And we can do it with fixed products and index products. So I would be hard pressed for a seller to come to me with a, a, a payment schedule that they want to implement that we couldn't accomplish for them. That's interesting. As far as the, from the, from Monty, your from point of view, what needs to be, I, I, you think of all the stuff a seller has to do during a sale, uh, especially when they're doing asset sale and they got to get all their assets identified line item. Then that big purchase price has to be kind of somehow divided amongst all of it. There's a lot of work that the CPAs and the attorneys and all do to, to make that work. When should they start talking to somebody like you and Chad when this is going to happen so that it's structured? Is there something, or is it, the first question I guess would be, could they mess it up? Like when they're doing those asset allocations to all the different prices, like even, even like brand equity and all these other stuff, all kinds of things getting in an asset sell, get labeled with a portion of that proceeds, right? In that mix, when they, I don't even know what that process is called. I pay somebody else to do it if I'm, 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 I'm when I'm at that stage, but there's an, I'm sure there's a name for it. But when they're allocating that, say I'm going to pay $2 million for business, there's 200 line items. It's not just divided evenly. The brands were something and the cars were something, right? Can they mess that up right. if they don't do it right? Do they need to work with somebody like you and know that there's going to be an instruction annuity on the other side of it? It's best. Uh, tax is a proactive process. And uh, if you don't deal with it early enough, you lose planning opportunities. The closer to the date, you're going right. to try to close out the deal. For M&A professionals, the time to really work with the client is when they're listing that business. And uh, you start working that out, identifying what's going on. I mean, anybody selling their business, there's several things that they need to know. One of them for sure is what's it worth. But every one of them wants to know where am I going to land on the backside of this? What's going to be in my pocket when this is over with? And this, if you're going to be asking, well, what's going to be in my pocket, which they all do ask that you've got to be able to start planning for the outcome of what's going to be in your pocket. So let's say, let's nail that issue on the allocation of purchase price that you're referencing. You have a, a business that you're selling for two or $3 million and that's for all the existing assets. Okay. So if it's for all the existing assets, some of those assets are going to drive ordinary income. Some of those assets are possibly going to drive capital gain. Some of the assets that are there may not even be justified to be purchased and they should be dropped off. You've got inventories that are there. You've got, uh, if there is real estate involved, I mean, every one of those is different. So determining what the breakdown on that is going to look like is super, is super important. If you're inside of a C Corp. I'm back to your, you set the premise right. on different entities earlier. So I'm looking at that. So let's say we're dealing with a C Corp and let's have, let's say they are in the manufacturing space and they are dealing with lots of capital. Most manufacturers have a lot of capital investment. So they may have two or $3 million worth of equipment. Well, if you have two or $3 million worth of equipment, but yet uh, we got depreciation recapture problems coming. What does that mean? Well, that means you've got to start dealing with it early enough to figure out if the equipment values really make sense at the upper level, lower level. We also have this wonderful thing, and you may have come across this before, Ron, called personal goodwill. And in any, in any business transaction, there is some element of the value in that business deal that's tied to the person. And we're talking the entrepreneur, preferably. Well, if you don't start that process early enough and you're down there at the end trying to deal with this, it could be too late to deal with that problem. And what happens if they could, if they're sitting there with a million or $2 million worth of personal goodwill. And really the thing on that is that's value that's tied to the person, not the business. And so even if there is depreciation recapture, if there's personal goodwill, it goes to the individual, that's capital gain. They got several, they could have several million dollars sitting there that could be deferred off into the future. But how can you deal with that if you wait until you're trying to close and you're a few days away and you realize I've got to do something about my tax? Right. So as early on in the process as possible, it's a proactive process. Now that's it, Ronald. I've had folks call me and say, I'm closing in two days. 
can you help me? And we can. We can move at breakneck speed and I can have quotes to a seller within an hour so that they can at least be looking at some options for themselves. It doesn't solve the problems Monty just addressed and it, it eliminates yeah. the ability to properly plan. But in the, the worst case scenario, if, if somebody is listening to this today and they're closing next week, we can help them. We just don't have as much runway as we That is correct. You can defer, even if it's a day before, is there something that could be done to help deal with deferral? Now, the answer to that is yes. It's just that there could have been a way to increase the level of income that's available right. for deferral if you'd started early enough. But is there something that could be done for what is there? Yes. No matter what. Time. And it sounds like it's, it's not just like, okay, the purchase price is $5 million, I'm going to stick $5 million into this annuity. They need to work with a CPA like you and figure out what portion of, you know, there's a lot more complex than somebody's about to wire me a bunch of money. Where am I sticking it? Which is kind of what a lot of the sellers that I've talked to, they kind of seem to think, well, I'll deal with that after the close. I'm like, well, there's certain things you could do with the money you need to deal with before it's wired to you. Once you receive it, it's done. And remember, it, once right. they receive it, if they take constructive receipt of it, the structured yeah. installment sale option is off the table. So that, because the money has to go from the escrow account to the life insurance company. Well, I've asked a bunch of questions so far. What should I be asking? I mean, what have we missed here? So, uh, like, I don't want to leave anybody with, get off the call and you guys go, man, you should ask this because they, they really need to know it. What do the listeners need to know about this product? Uh, let's, let's back into a little, some of the things I can think of kind of flow with points that you had previously made. And you're talking about business deals. And everybody's not going to have the same kind of structure. That's just the reality of it. Some people are S-Corps. Some people are LLCs. Some people are C-Corps. Some people are sole proprietors. Some people are going to sell equity. Some people are going to sell assets. Some people are going to do both. Uh, they can, you can do a thing called a bifurcation. Yeah. One entity, asset sell and an equity deal, both at the same time. So let's just, uh, let's kind of hit a few things that, uh, that will help. Let's take an LLC. LLC tax is a partnership. Let's just do that. Common mistake is the reason why I'm bringing this one up. It's a common mistake that when somebody sells their LLC, they think that they'll get the same outcome as selling the stock of a corporation. And when stock of a corporation is sold, the general thought is I'm going to pay capital gain on that. I got capital gain coming. I'll pay capital gain tax. And, and generally that would be accurate on, on, on stock with an LLC though, tax as a partnership, it's the underlying assets inside that LLC that drive the tax. So the asset being sold is the equity, the LLC member interest, and you can sell a hundred percent of it. But in the tax code, when you sell a hundred percent, you're deemed to actually be selling assets. So now we're back to the same issue. What are the, all the underlying assets and what portion of those assets and the gains uh, can be deferred? What can be there? So mistake or with, in the tax world, mistakes happen with LLC member interest that is, they are not treated in that like stock sales are treated. It is generally the underlying asset base that drives the outcome for tax. The, the big issue in business deals, and I'm sure you face this, is the working capital seem, it's a really a big issue. As the deal size grows, working capital in these business transactions also grows with it. And so working capital transfers can create issues. And that is you're going to have receivables and inventory and uh, accounts payable, those different things flowing as a part of the assets included in a deal. Well, inventories are not available to be structured. Accounts receivable uh, them, themselves don't fall into that same category. And so what we're dealing with here is we're trying to identify no matter what, even when working capital is included, we're trying to come down to those assets that create capital gain, those assets that create capital gain. For the listeners on the podcast, if they bought a business in the last 15 years, or if they previously purchased a business, let's just go that way. Very likely they have been amortizing as a tax deduction, goodwill. Goodwill is subject to depreciation recapture, just like physical assets are. So if the business hasn't grown tremendously, but yet it's been 10 to 15 years since the business was bought, well, that seller could be facing down some 
ordinary tax treatment on the sale of the goodwill, which typically doesn't happen. And a lot of the CPAs do not even think about that uh, when it's occurring. Another item is subject to, that is subject and available here, is when you sell a non-compete. It's a crazy thing. People do not realize this. It's in the, in the tax code, a non-compete arrangement is deemed to be an asset. I bet you that, that the treasury regs kind of label it out that way. So, so can somebody sell that and possibly defer that? that? There's something there that a lot of people don't think about. There could be some deferrals coming in off of that because it's deemed to be an asset. One last point I'll make that, that's not even business related is in, in excess of anybody's exemption available on the sale of their home, any gain on the sale of their personal home is available for use in this solution. Okay. So everybody that's here listening that even if, they're, even if they're not selling their business, they just happen to be selling their home, anything above the exemption that they can get from the, for the exemption on the sale of that property, any additional gain is available for this strategy. So if you were above that limit and you were trying to downsize, like my in-laws just did, funny they downsized, but they bought a bigger house, but in a lower cost area, right? That's uh, right. Palo Alto houses are very expensive. And then we move up here into the, I live, we live near them, but they move up here and bought a bigger house for a third of what it costs, you know, to sell the smaller one, uh, you know, what they sold the smaller one for. Anything above that amount that was their personal exemption, they could have put into a, a product like this. They, it's too late now. They didn't, but they could have put away that. And that was a significant sell. Yeah. Think about how many of those transactions are happening in California where property values have just skyrocketed. I mean, California is its own animal when it comes to real estate, but there yeah. is profound opportunity for real estate business uh, folks. I won't give you California. their, I won't give you their sales price because I don't have authority to do that because it's theirs, but it was a mile or two from Stanford University. So if it gives you anything, <laughs> you know, and then we moved up here and this house was less than a million dollars. So it was yeah. more than two. I'll put it that yeah. way. But yeah. uh, so they had room to do something like that. Interesting. There's there are others interesting products when you hit numbers that big that banks do different things and stuff. So uh, that's another show for another day. One yeah. last question. I know we're a little bit over time, but let's just, I got one last question just eating up my head. It's because it's a scenario that happened about a year ago. Owner calls me and says, hey, you know a lot about selling businesses. I'm not really wanting to sell my business, but you might be able to answer my question or point me to the right advisor. And the scenario was you had a business partner that was is or they had somebody bring it on as a business partner, make the story fun. It was actually one of his other business partner's son who the business guy passed away. Lead sales guy and just killing it in sales, growing the business, doing good. He wants to bring him on as a partner, but he wants to sell a piece of the business to him. And it was a significant sale. So what they did was kind of cool. They had been saving his bonuses up, the sales bonuses. And now he's got a million dollars worth of uh, saved deferred income or whatever sitting there. They're going to give that to the owner to buy it. Can you take a partial sell where like I'm selling 50% of my company to a partner and bringing on a partner? Can I put that in annuity or is it a one-time transaction because I'm selling a full asset? Now, are you talking about for the equity piece? Yeah. So I'm running, the business is still going, right? but I'm selling 50% of my equity to a third party who's going to be a partner in it. I'm getting the, that money's getting dispersed to me as the seller of that portion of my business. Can I put that in this product or is it the IRS code for the total transaction of like leaving a, an entity? No, the, if you're talking about a 50% sell of an existing structure, so you really do have an equity transaction that's mm -hmm. happening. Okay. Not looking at any other pieces of that puzzle. I know the pieces of the puzzle. You're trying to get money out to a seller, uh, out to the buyer, so the buyer can pay the seller and all that kind of stuff. So let's just focus entirely to the taxation that would be recognized by the seller. Can that tax on that equity deal uh, be deferred under this solution? The answer would be yes. And then the answer would be it would have to be structured maybe a little differently between the entity types. So if you had a C Corp, S Corp, and LLC, further delineation of how the layers of that would be have to be handled. But can the sell of 50% of the equity I'll be used in this structure to defer the tax that the seller of that equity would recognize? In, even in an existing business and it's a partner buy-in, can that happen? The answer is yes. Cool. And then the last question, we do have a lot of people doing this one. They sell all or, or most of their company to an ESOP, an employee stock option program, or they basically sell it to the employees. Can the proceeds from that sell still go into a product like yours? Now, that one 
has got a multitude of answers to it, and we would be here for a while. Okay. But let me answer just generally, okay? In a leveraged ESOP transaction, what's really happening is the stock or the equity is put into the ESOP, and then the company is paying that out over time. You've already got installment provision. There's no cash, okay? Right. In an ESOP, there can be cash that's funded through a lending source, mm -hmm. and you can invest that money into blue chips and still defer income gain recognition, okay? So assuming that neither one of those are happening, then the answer could be would be if the ESOP transaction is generating cash to the holder of the stock, and ultimately there would be no other mechanism that would be available under those ESOP regs to defer that, yes. So the yeah. answer is maybe they need to talk to you first. Well, that. So I think what you're picking up is that you got a, they got a team that they would approach with Chad and I that, that, that we can figure out that what can work with them. Yeah. So, okay. so the reason I asked that, my dream deal is I don't want to be the CEO of a $25 million company. I'm 51 and I probably got about 10 years worth of work I even want to do in me. But my dream deal would be to find a 25 to $50 million valuation company that had real estate that they're sitting on that's worth almost as much as the business. Because I have a team that can actually do a sell leasebacks on a premium on that and pretty much buy the entire business from the real estate purchase price. So mm -hmm. they would give us that. So basically, I'd buy the real estate and the business as one unit. I would sell leaseback the real estate through this entity, pay the owner down on his, basically give that money to the owner. And then you would have to raise a lot less capital to either own the company. And then later, within probably 12 to 18 months, sell the entire thing to the employees through an ESOP that's funded through third-party banks. I've got a company that'll do that. Walk away with hold, say, 20% equity in the company and have a decent check for doing the transaction and be in and out of it in less than two years. Mm -hmm. That's the dream deal. Like, that's my unicorn I hunt for. But, you know, the, the dream deal my unicorn I hunt for is that kind of scenario. So that's why I was asking these complex questions is, okay. When that unicorn comes across, can I stuff some of that money into the structure? And you, you answered it. The answer is call you. The one thing, Ron, I, I, I would just mention, a lot of your listeners uh, have relationships with financial planners and folks that they've been talking to on the golf course or at the bar for years about how am I going to exit my business and what am I going to do with my money? And now they're hearing about this strategy, which is something that their financial planners, quite honestly, have probably never heard of. And quite honestly, they don't have access to it. Go back to the very beginning of our conversation. I'm in this situation because of my work as a settlement planner in personal injury space. Mm -hmm. The life insurance companies that are offering this product have come to us as trusted financial advisors and representatives of their companies to understand the complexities of IRS documentation and, and making certain that every I is dotted and T is crossed with these these transactions and they are offering this through a finite number of us across the country. And so I just want to encourage your listeners that if they approach their trusted financial planner and say, Hey, I want to do this, they may get a lot of pushback because that financial planner is, is saying, gosh, I've been working with you for three or five years trying to plan this. And now my commission is going to walk out the door because you're going to go and, and do this other, other product. I will always work cooperatively with somebody's financial planners. We will always find a solution. We are not looking to take food off of somebody else's table. We want to be able to transact a solution that makes the most sense for the seller. And if that means we need to, to work cooperatively with their, their folks that are already in place and who, with whom they've been working for many years, we are always happy to do that, and we will do that. I just want to make that point clear because I think it is important. Awesome, awesome. We're heading out to the end of the time. So what's the best way people can reach out to you? Yeah, direct number for me is 770-886-7400. They can also find us on uh, online at jcrsettlements.com forward slash installment dash sales. Awesome. And then Monty, if somebody wants to help them straighten out how this, the M&A structure should look like, are you taking on new clients in the CPA realm of like planning this out and getting them ready to work with uh, Chad and his company? Absolutely. Now, Chad would route me in as the, as any opportunities coming in that would involve us certainly in the, 
in, in pre-planning, there's things I identify where this is applicable and I would route it right to Chad. So they can reach me on any of the structuring M&A type advisory support work at, they can, call, they can find me at walkeradvisory.com. So that's okay. walkeradvisory.com. Or they can call me at 940-322-5086. So uh, that said, I appreciate your time here. I appreciate the knowledge you shared with our, uh, our customers and our listeners here. And uh, thank you both. Thank you, Ryan. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Cool. Thanks. Hang on for just a second. We'll call that a show. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and M&A decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the itexchangenet.com slash marketplace, how to exit. That link will be in the show notes. Visit them now.